Hey guys, welcome to my channel, No Better Do Better with Jess. We're up to day six of my daily video Christmas countdown. We're going to continue reading the book, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by Frank Baum. I thought it was only going to be two videos, but I missed a section, so this is going to be day two of three. Let's get started. Chapter One, The Laughing Valley. When Claus came, the valley was empty, save for the grass, the brook, the wildflowers, the bees, and the butterflies. If he would make his home here and live after the fashion of men, he must have a house. This puzzled him at first, but while he stood smiling in the sunshine, he suddenly found beside him old Nelko, the servant of the master woodsman. Nelko bore an axe, strong and broad, with blade that gleamed like burnished silver. This he placed in the young man's hand, then disappeared without a word. Claus understood, and turning to the forest edge, he selected a number of fallen tree trunks, which he began to clear of their dead branches. He would not cut into a living tree. His life among the nymphs who guarded the forest had taught him that a live tree is sacred, being a created thing endowed with feeling. But with the dead and fallen trees, it was different. They had fulfilled their destiny as active members of the forest community, and now it was fitting that their remains should minister to the needs of man. The axe bit deep into the logs at every stroke. It seemed to have had a force of its own, and claws had but to swing and guide it. When shadows began creeping over the green hills to lie in the valley overnight, the young man had chopped many logs into equal lengths and proper shapes for building a house such as he had seen the poorer classes of men inhabit. Then, resolving to await another day, before he tried to fit the logs together, Claus ate some of the sweet roots he well knew how to find, drank deeply from the laughing brook, and lay down to sleep on the grass, first seeking a spot where no flowers grew, lest the weight of his body should crush them. And while he slumbered and breathed in the perfume of the wondrous valley, the spirit of happiness crept into his heart and drove out all terror and care and misgivings. Nevermore would the face of Claus be clouded with anxieties. Nevermore would the trials of life weigh him down as with a burden. The laughing valley had claimed him for its own. Would that we all might live in that delightful place, but then maybe it would become overcrowded. For ages it had waited a tenant. Was it chance that led young Claus to make his home in this happy vale? Or may we guess that his thoughtful friends, the immortals, had directed his steps when he wandered away from Bursey to seek a home in the great world? Certain it is that while the moon peered over the hilltop and flooded with its soft beams the body of the sleeping stranger, the laughing valley was filled with the queer crooked shapes of the friendly nooks. These people spoke no words, but worked with skill and swiftness. The logs Claus had trimmed with his bright axe were carried to a spot beside the brook and fitted one upon another, and during the night a strong and roomy dwelling was built. The birds came sweeping into the valley at daybreak, and their song, so seldom heard in the deep wood, aroused the stranger. He rubbed the web of sleep from his eyelids and looked around. The house met his glaze. I must thank the nooks for this, said he gratefully. Then he walked to his dwelling and entered at the doorway. A large room faced him, having a fireplace at one end and a table and bench in the middle. Beside the fireplace was a cupboard. Another doorway was beyond. Claus entered here also and saw a smaller room with a bed against the wall and a stool set near a small stand. On the bed were many layers of dried moss brought from the forest. Indeed, it's a palace, exclaimed Smiling Claus. I must thank the good nooks again for their knowledge of man's needs as well as for their labors on my behalf. He left his new home with a glad feeling that he was not quite alone in the world. Although he had chosen to abandon his forest life, friendships are not easily broken, and the immortals are everywhere. Upon reaching the brook, he drank of the pure water and then sat down on the bank to laugh at the mischievous gambols of the ripples as they pushed one another against rocks or crowded desperately to see which should first reach the turn beyond. And as they raced away, he listened to the song they sang. Rushing, pushing, on we go. Not a wave may gently flow. All are too excited, every drop delighted, turns to spray a merry play, as we tumble on our way. Next, Claus searched for roots to eat, 
While the daffodils turned their little eyes up to him, laughingly, and lisped their dainty song, blooming fairly, growing rarely, never flowers were so gay, perfume breathing, joy bequeathing, as our colors we display. It made Claus laugh to hear the little things voice their happiness as they nodded gracefully on their stems, but another strain caught his ear at the sunbeams fell gently across his face and whispered, Here is gladness that our rays warm the valley through the days. Here is happiness to give comfort unto all who live. Yes, cried Claus in answer, there is happiness joy in all things here. The Laughing Valley is a valley of peace and goodwill. He passed the day talking with the ants and beetles and exchanging jokes with the light-hearted butterflies, and at night he lay on his bed of soft moss and slept soundly. Then came the fairies, merry but noiseless, bringing skillets and pots and dishes and pans and all the tools necessary to prepare food and to comfort a mortal. With these they filled the cupboard and fireplace, finally placing a stout suit of wool clothing on the stool by the bedside. When Claus awoke, he rubbed his eyes again and laughed and spoke aloud his thanks to the fairies and the master woodsman who had sent them. With eager joy, he examined all his new possessions, wondering what some might be used for. But in the days when he had clung to the girdle of the great ark and visited the cities of men, his eyes had been quick to note all the manners and customs of the race to which he belonged. So he guessed from the gifts brought by the fairies that the master expected him hereafter to live in the fashion of his fellow creatures. Which means I must plow the earth and plant corn, he reflected, so that when winter comes I shall have gathered food in plenty. But as he stood in the grassy valley, he saw that to turn up the earth in furrows would be to destroy hundreds of pretty helpless flowers, as well as thousands of the tender blades of grass, and this he could not bear to do. Therefore he stretched out his arms and uttered a peculiar whistle he had learned in the forest, afterwards crying, Reels of the field flowers come to me. Instantly a dozen of the queer little reels were squatting upon the ground before him, and they nodded to him in cheerful greeting. Claus gazed upon them earnestly. Your brothers of the forest, he said, I have known and loved many years. I shall love you also when we have become friends. To me, the laws of the rills, whether those of the forest or of the fields, are sacred. I have never willingly destroyed one of the flowers you tend so carefully. But I must plant grain to use for food during the cold winter. And how am I to do this without killing the little creatures that sing to me so brittily of their flagrant blossoms? The yellow reel, he who tends the buttercups, made answer, Fret not, friend Claus, the great Auk has spoken to us of you. There is better work for you in life than to labor for food, and though, not being of the forest, Auk has no command over us. Nevertheless, we are glad to favor one he loves. Live, therefore, to do the good work you are resolved to undertake. We, the field reels, will attend to your food supplies. After this speech that the reels were no longer to be seen, and Claus drove from his mind the thought of tilling to the earth. When next he wandered back to his dwelling, a bowl of fresh milk stood upon the table. Bread was in the cupboard, and sweet honey filled a dish beside it. A pretty basket of rosy apples and new plucked grapes was also awaiting him. He called out, Thanks, my friends, to the invisible reels, and straightway began to eat of the food. Thereafter, when hungry, he had but looked into the cupboard to find goodly supplies brought by the kindly reels, and the nooks cut and stacked much wood for his fireplace, and the fairies brought him warm blankets and clothing. So began his life in the Laughing Valley, with the favor and friendship of the immortals to minister to his every want. Chapter 2 How Claus Made the First Toy Truly our Claus has wisdom for his good fortune but strengthened his resolve to befriend the little ones of his own race. He knew his plan was approved by the immortals, else they would not have favored him so greatly. So he began at once to make acquaintance with mankind. He walked through the valley to the plain beyond, and crossed the plain in many directions to reach the abodes of men. These stood singly, or in groups of dwellings called villages, and in nearly all the houses, whether big or little, Claus found children. The youngsters soon came to know his merry laughing face and the kind glance of his bright eyes, and the parents, while they regarded the young man with some scorn for loving children more than their elders, 
were content that the girls and boys had found a playfellow who seemed willing to amuse them. So the children romped and played games with Claus, and the boys rode upon his shoulders, and the girls nestled in his strong arms, and the babes clung fondly to his knees. Wherever the young man chanced to be, the sound of childish laughter followed him, and to understand this better, you must know that children were much neglected in those days and received little attention from their parents, so that it became to them a marvel that so goodly a man as Claus devoted his time to making them happy. And those who knew him were, you may be sure, very happy indeed. The sad faces of the poor and abused grew bright for once. The cripples smiled despite his misfortune. The ailing ones hushed their moans and grieved ones, their cries when their merry friend came nigh to comfort them. Only at the beautiful palace of the Lord of Lords and at the frowning castle of the Baron Braun was Claus refused admittance. There were children at both places, but the servants at the palace shut the door in the young stranger's face, and the fierce Baron threatened to hang him from an iron hook on the castle walls, whereupon Claus sighed and went back to the porter dwellings, where he was welcome. After a time, the winter drew near. The flowers lived out their lives and faded and disappeared. The beetles burrowed far into the warm earth. The butterflies deserted the meadows, and the voice of the brook grew hoarse, as if it had taken cold. One day, snowflakes filled all the air in the Laughing Valley, dancing boisterously towards the earth and clothing in pure white raiment the roof of Claus's dwelling. At night, Jack Frost rapped at the door. "'Come in,' cried Claus. "'Come out,' answered Jack, "'for you have a fire inside.' So Claus came out. He had known Jack Frost in the forest and liked the jolly rogue, even while he mistrusted him. "'There will be rare sport for me tonight, Claus,' shouted the sprite. "'Isn't this glorious weather? "'I shall nip scores of noses and ears and toes before daybreak. "'If you love me, Jack, spare the children,' begged Claus. "'And why?' asked the other in surprise. They are tender and helpless, answered Claus, but I love to nip the tender ones, declared Jack. The older ones are tough and tie my fingers. The young ones are weak and cannot fight you, said Claus. True, agreed Jack thoughtfully. Well, I will not pinch a child this night if I can resist the temptation, he promised. Good night, Claus. Good night. The young man went in and closed the door, and Jack Frost ran to the nearest village. Claus threw a log on the fire, which burned up brightly. Beside the hearth, that blinky, a big cat, gave him by Peter the nook. Her fur was soft and glossy, and she purred never-ending songs of contentment. "'I shall not see the children again soon,' said Claus to the cat, who kindly paused in her song to listen. "'The winter is upon us. The snow will be deep for many days, and I shall be unable to play with my little friends.' cat raised a paw and stroked her nose thoughtfully, but made no reply. So long as the fire burned and Claus sat in his easy chair by the hearth, she did not mind the weather. So passed many days and many evenings. The cupboard was always full, but Claus became weary with having nothing to do more than to feed the fire from the big wood pile the nooks had brought him. One evening he picked up a stick of wood and began to cut it with his sharp knife. He had no thought at first except to occupy his time, and he whistled and sang to the cat as he carved away portions of the stick. Puss sat up on her hunches and watched him, listening at the same time to her master's merry whistle, which she loved to hear even more than her own purring songs. Claus glanced at Puss and then at the stick he was whittling, until presently the wood began to have a shape, and the shape was like the head of a cat, with two ears sticking upward. Claus stopped whistling to laugh, and then both he and the cat looked at the wooden image in some surprise. Then he carved out the eyes and the nose, and rounded the lower part of the head so that it rested upon a neck. Puss hardly knew what to make of it now, and sat up stiffly, as if watching with some suspicion what would come next. Claus knew. The head gave him an idea. He plied his knife carefully and with skill, forming slowly the body of the cat, which he made to sit upon its haunches as the real cat did, with her tail wound around her two front legs. The work cost him much time, but the evening was so long and he had nothing better to do. Finally, he gave a loud and delighted laugh at the result of his labors and placed the wooden cat, now completed, upon the hearth opposite the real one. 
Puss thereupon glared at her image, raised her hair in anger, and uttered a defiant mew. The wooden cat paid no attention, and Claus, much amused, laughed again. The Blinky advanced towards the wooden image to eye it closely and smell of it intelligently. Eyes and nose told her the creature was wood, in spite of its natural appearance. So Puss resumed her seat and her purring, but as she neatly washed her face with her powdered paw, she cast more than one admiring glance at her clever master. Perhaps she felt the same satisfaction we feel when we look upon good photographs of ourselves. The cat's master was himself pleased with his handiwork, without knowing exactly why. Indeed, he had great cause to congratulate himself that night, and all the children throughout the world should have joined him rejoicing, for Claus had made his first toy. Chapter 3 How the Reels Colored the Toys A hush lay on the Laughing Valley now. Snow covered it like a white spread, and pillows of downy flakes drifted before the dwelling, where Claus sat feeding the blaze of the fire. The brook gurgled on beneath a heavy sheet of ice, and all living plants and insects nestled close to Mother Earth to keep warm. The face of the moon was hid by dark clouds, and the wind, delighting in the wintry sport, pushed and whirred the snowflakes in so many directions that they could get no chance to fall to the ground. Claus heard the wind whistling and shrieking in its play, and thanked the good nooks again for his comfortable shelter. Blinky washed her face lazily and stared at the coals with a look of perfect content. The toy cat sat opposite the real one and gazed straight ahead, as toy cats should. Suddenly, Claus heard a noise that sounded different from the voice of the wind. It was more like a wail of suffering and despair. He stood up and listened, but the wind, growing boisterous, shook the door and rattled the windows to distract his attention. He waited until the wind was tired, and then, still listening, he heard once more the shrill cry of distress. Quickly, he drew on his coat, pulled his cap over his eyes, and opened the door. The wind dashed in and scattered the embers over the hearth, at the same time blowing Blinky's fur so furiously that she crept under the table to escape. Then the door was closed and Claus was outside, peering anxiously into the darkness. The wind laughed and scolded and tried to push him over, but he stood firm. The helpless flakes stumbled against his eyes and dimmed his sight, but he rubbed them away and looked again. Snow was everywhere, white and glittering. It covered the earth and filled the air. The cry was not repeated. Claus turned to go back into the house, but the wind caught him unaware, and he stumbled and fell across a snowdrift. His hand plunged into the drift and touched something that was not snow. This he seized, and pulling it gently toward him, found it to be a child. The next moment he had lifted it in his arms and carried it into the house. The wind followed him through the door, but Claus shut it out quickly. He laid the rescued child on the hearth, and brushing away the snow, he discovered it to be Weakum, a little boy who lived in a house beyond the valley. Claus wrapped a warm blanket around the little one and rubbed the frost from his limbs. Before long, the child opened his eyes and, seeing where he was, smiled happily. Then Claus warmed milk, fed it to the boy slowly while the cat looked on with sober curiosity. Finally, the little one curled up in his friend's arms and sighed and fell asleep, and Claus, filled with gladness that he had found the wanderer, held him closely while he slumbered. The wind, finding no more mischief to do, climbed the hill and swept on towards the north. This gave the weary snowflakes time to settle down to earth, and the valley became still again. The boy, having slept well in the arms of his friend, opened his eyes and sat up. Then, as a child will, he looked around the room and saw all that it contained. Your cat is a nice cat, Claus, he said. At last, let me hold it. But Puss objected and ran away. The other cat won't run, Claus, continued the boy. Let me hold that one. Claus placed the toy in his arms, and the boy held it lovingly and kissed the tip of its wooden ear. How did you get lost in the storm, Weakum? asked Claus. I started to walk to my auntie's house and lost my way, he answered. Were you frightened? It was cold, said Weakum, and the snow got in my eyes so I could not see. Then I kept on till I fell in the snow, without knowing where I was, and the wind blew the flakes over me and covered me up. 
Claus gently stroked his head, and the boy looked up at him and smiled. I'm all right now, said Weakum. Yes, replied Claus happily. Now I'll put you in my warm bed, and you must sleep until morning, and I will carry you back to your mother. May the cat sleep with me, asked the boy. Yes, if you wish it to, answered Claus. It's a nice cat, Weakum said, smiling, as Claus tucked the blankets around him, and presently the little one fell asleep with the wooden toy in his arms. When morning came, the sun claimed the laughing valley and flooded it with rays, so Claus prepared to take the lost child back to its mother. May I keep the cat, Claus? asked Weakum. It's nicer than real cats. It doesn't run away or scratch or bite. May I keep it? Yes, indeed, answered Claus, pleased that the toy had made to give pleasure to the child. So he wrapped the boy and the wooden cat in a warm cloak, parched the bundle upon his own broad shoulders, and then he tramped through the snow and the drifts of the valley, and across the plain beyond to the poor cottage where Weakum's mother lived. See, Mama, cried the boy, as soon as they entered, I've got a cat. The good woman wept tears of joy over the rescue of her darling, and thanked Claus many times for his kind act so he carried a warm and happy heart back to his home in the valley. That night, he said to Puss, I believe the children will love the wooden cats almost as well as the real ones, and they can't hurt them by pulling their tails and ears. I'll make another. So, this was the beginning of his great work. The next cat was better made than the first. While Claus sat whittling it out, the yellow reel came in to make him a visit, and so pleased was he with the man's skill that he ran away and brought several of his fellows. There sat the red reel, the black reel, the green reel, the blue reel, and the yellow reel in a circle on the floor, while Claus whittled and whittled, and the wooden cat grew into shape. If it could be made the same color as the real cat, no one would know the difference, said the yellow reel thoughtfully. The little ones maybe would not know the difference, replied Claus, pleased with the idea. I will bring you some of the red that I color my roses and tulips with, cried the red reel, and then you can make the cat's lips and tongues red. I will bring some of the green that I colored my grass and leaves with, said the green reel, and then you can color the cat's eyes green. They will need a bit of yellow also, remarked the yellow reel. I must fetch some of the yellow that I used to color my buttercups and goldenrods with. The real cat is black, said the black reel. I will bring some of the black that I used to color the eyes of my pansies with, and then you can paint your wooden cat black. I see you have a blue ribbon around Blinky's neck, added the blue reel. I'll get some of the color that I used to paint the bluebells and forget-me-nots with, and then you could carve a wooden ribbon on the toy cat's neck and paint it blue. So the reels disappeared, and by the time Claus had finished carving out the form of the cat, they were all back with the paints and brushes. They made Blinky sit upon the table that Claus might paint the toy cat just the right color, and when the work was done, the reels declared it was as exactly as good as the live cat. That is, to all appearances, added the red reel. Blinky seemed a little offended by the attention bestowed upon the toy, that she might not seem to approve the imitation cat. She walked to the corner of the hearth and sat down with a dignified air. But Claus was delighted, and soon as morning came, he started out and tramped through the snow, across the valley to the plain, until he came to a village. There, in a poor hut near the walls of the beautiful palace of the Lord of Laird, a little girl lay upon a wretched cot, moaning with pain. Claus approached the child and kissed her and comforted her, and then he drew the toy cat from beneath his coat, where he had hidden it and placed it in her arms. Ah, oh, how well he felt himself repaid for his labor and his long walk when he saw the little one's eyes grow bright with pleasure. She hugged the kitty tightly to her breast, as it had been a precious gem, and would not let it go for a single moment. The fever was quieted, the pain grew less, and she fell into a sweet, refreshing sleep. Claus laughed and whistled and sang all the way home. Never had he been so happy as on that day. When he entered his house, he found Shagira the lioness awaiting him. Since his babyhood, Shagira had loved Claus, and while he dwelt in the forest, she had often come to visit him at Nasil's bower. As Claus had gone to live in the Laughing Valley, Shagira became lonely and ill at ease, and now she had braved the snowdrifts, which all lions abhor, to see him once more. 
Shigeru was getting old and her teeth were beginning to fall out, and while the hairs that tipped her ears and tail had changed from tawny yellow to white, Claus found her lying on his hearth, and he put his arms around the neck of the lioness and hugged her lovingly. The cat had retired into a far corner. She did not care to associate with Shigeru. Claus told his old friend about the cats he had made and how much pleasure they had given Weakum and the sick girl. Shigeru did not know much about children. Indeed, if she met a child, she could scarcely be trusted not to devour it. But she was interested in Claus's new labors and said, These images seem to me very attractive, yet I cannot see why you should make cats, which are very unimportant animals. Suppose now that I am here, you make the image of a lioness, the queen of all the beasts, then indeed your children will be happy and safe at the same time. Claus thought this was a good suggestion, so he got a piece of wood and sharpened his knife, while Shigeru crouched upon the hearth at his feet. With much care he carved the head of the likeness of the lioness, even to the two fierce teeth that curved over her lower lip and the deep frowning lines above her wide open eyes. When it was finished, he said, You have a terrible look, Shigeru. Then the image is like me, she answered, for I am indeed terrible to all who are not my friends. Claus now carved out the body with Shigeru's long tail trailing behind it. The image of the crouching lioness was very lifelike. It pleased me, said Shigeru, yawning and stretching her body gracefully. Now I will watch while you paint. He brought the paints that the rails had given him from the cupboard and covered, colored the image to resemble the real Shigeru. The lioness placed her big padded paws upon the edge of the table and raised herself while she carefully examined the toy that was her likeness. You are indeed skillful, she said proudly. The children will like that better than cats, I'm sure. Then snarling at Blinky, who arched her back in terror and whined fearfully, she walked away towards her forest home with stately strides. Chapter 4 How Little Mary Become Frightened the winter was over now, and all the Laughing Valley was filled with joyous excitement. The brook was so happy at being free once again that it gurgled more boisterously than ever and dashed so recklessly against the rocks that it sent showers of spray high into the air. The grass thrust its sharp little blades upward through the mat of dead stalks where it had hidden from the snow, but the flowers were yet too timid to show themselves. Although the rills were busy feeding their roots, the sun was too it was in remarkably good humor that sent his rays dancing merrily through the valley claus was eating his dinner one day when he heard a timid knock on his door come in he called no one entered but after a pause came another rapping claus jumped up and threw open the door before him stood a small girl holding his smaller brother fast by the hand is you claus she asked shyly Indeed I am, my dear, he answered with a laugh as he caught both children in his arms and kissed them. You're very welcome, and you've come just in time to share my dinner. He took them to the table and fed them with fresh milk and nut cakes. When they had eaten enough, he asked, Why have you made this long journey to see me? I want a cat, replied the little Mary, and her brother, who had not yet learned to speak many words, nodded his head and explained like an echo, Tat! Oh! You want my toy cats, do you, returned Claus, greatly pleased to discover that his creations were so popular with children. The little visitors nodded eagerly. Unfortunately, he continued, I have but one cat now ready, for I carried two to children in town yesterday, and the one I, have, I shall be given to your brother, Mary, because he is smaller, and the next one I shall make be for you. The boy's face was bright with smiles as he took the precious toy Claus held out to him. But little May recovered her face with her arm and began to sob grievously. I, 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 I want a cat now, she wailed. Her disappointment made Claus feel miserable for a moment. Then he suddenly remembered Shigeru. Don't cry, darling, he said soothingly. I have a toy much nicer than a cat and you shall have that went to the cupboard and drew out the image of the lioness, which she placed on the table before Mary. The girl raised her arm and gave one glance at the fierce teeth and glaring eyes of the beast, and then, uttering a terrified scream, she rushed from the house. The boy followed her, also screaming lustily and even dropping his precious cat in the fear. For a moment, Claus stood motionless, being puzzled and astonished. Then he threw Shigeru's image into the cupboard and ran after the children, calling to them not to be frightened. 
Little Mary stopped in her flight, and her brother clung to her skirt, but they both cast fearful glances at the house until Claus had assured them many, many times that the beast had been locked in the cupboard. Yet why were you frightened at seeing it, he asked. It's only a toy to play with. It's bad, said Mary decidedly, and and just horrid and not a bit nice like cats. Perhaps you're right, returned Claus thoughtfully, but if you will return with me to the house, I will soon make you a pretty cat. So they timidly entered the house again, having faith in their friend's words, and afterward they had the joy of watching Claus carve a cat from a bit of wood and paint it in natural colors. It did not take him long to do this, for he had become skillful with his knife by this time, and Mary loved her toy the more dearly because she had seen it made. After his little visitors had trotted away on their journey homeward, Claus sat long in deep thought, and he then decided that such fierce creatures as his friend the lioness would never do as models for which to fashion his toys. There must be nothing to frighten the dear babies, he reflected, and while I know Shigeru well, and I'm not afraid of her, it is but natural that children should look upon her image with terror. Hereafter I will choose such mild-mannered animals as squirrels and rabbits and deer and lambkins from which to carve my toys, for then the little ones will love rather than fear them. He began his work that very day, and before bedtime had made a wooden rabbit and a lamb. They were not quite so lifelike as the cats had been, because they were formed for memory, while Blinky had sat very still for Claus to look at while he worked. But the, no, the new toys pleased the children nevertheless, and the fame of Claus's playthings quickly spread to every cottage on plain and in village. He always carried his gifts to the sick or the crippled children, but those who were strong enough walked to the house in the valley to ask for them. So a little path was soon warmed from the plain to the door of the toy maker's cottage. First came the children who had been playmates of Claus before he began to make toys. These, you may be sure, were well supplied. Then children who lived further away heard the wonderful images and made journeys to the valley to secure them. All little ones were welcome, and never a one went away empty-handed. This demand for his handiwork kept Claus busily occupied, but he was quite happy in knowing the pleasure he gave to so many of the dear children. His friends, the immortals, were pleased with his success and supported him bravely. The nook selected for him clear pieces of soft wood, that his knife might not be blunted in cutting them. The rowels kept him supplied with paints of all colors and brushes fashioned from the tips of Timothy grass. The fairies discovered that the workmen needed saws and chisels and hammers and nails, as well as knives, and brought him a goodly array of such tools. Claus soon turned his living room into a most wonderful workshop. He built a bench before the window and arranged his tools and paints so that he could reach everything as he sat on his stool. As he finished toy after toy to delight the hearts of little children, he found himself growing so gay and happy that he could not refrain from singing and laughing and whistling all the day long. It's because I live in the Laughing Valley where everything else laughs, said Claus, but that was not the reason. That's all I'm going to do for today. These chapters were longer than yesterday. Come back tomorrow for part three. Maybe might be part three or four by the looks of it. I hope my buddy Mac is still enjoying my little stories at night. There will be a new one tomorrow. Guys, be sure you like and share and subscribe to the videos. Tell me if there's any more stories that you want to do. I'll probably do the Nutcracker because it's my favorite. But now the question of the day. What was your favorite gift from Santa Claus? Until tomorrow, bye.